more prayer. God, I come before you and I thank you for everything that you are. Knowing that as I come before this word to bring something so beautifully revealed to us that I am undeserving of it. But in your grace, you have given it to me. I thank you that in you we become participants in your righteousness and therefore we are able to have peace with you. I thank you for everything that you are and I pray that as I come before this word that your spirit would guide me in it and it would not be upon my own strength that I come before it. Um, I pray that it would land on ears that are open and hearts that are attuned to who you are, attuned by the Spirit, um, that their affections would be captivated and rekindled, for you are the only worthy object. And so many times we become allured and captivated by this world, but that I would pray that we would be rekindled and relit a flame each and every day for you. And in your precious and holy name, amen. So we've been going through a series right now, um, looking at the shadows of Christ throughout the whole Old Testament. Um, we started, and we, if we go a little bit back, we looked at Adam, um, how Christ is the greater Adam, that what Adam failed to do, Christ perfectly did. Then we went and moved to, I think we looked at Noah, um, and we looked at Noah as the shadow and in that shadow of Christ. And then, again, we looked at how we are all become and how we all have become a family in Christ. And then last week was Abraham and how he was a shadow that pointed to Christ. Before pointing forward, now we look back, moving forward by Christ and Christ alone and his spirit alone. So as we looked at Abraham last week, we are going to look at a um, person that is embedded within the Abraham story, um, one that is overlooked a lot, one that is has only four verses really written about him, um, but that the author of the New Testament book of Hebrews looked back to and really saw a beautiful picture within him. Um, and bravely, I tried to do this. I guess I got a little cocky, and there's like four verses on this guy. It'll probably be about a three to five minute sermon, so I apologize. But we're going to move forward in this together, and hopefully you'll learn something from it other than my unintelligent way. So we start in verse 17, but the precursor to this is Abraham, there's a war of kings. And it's walking through this war of kings, and there's this interruption in the story where it talks about Lot, Abraham's nephew, being captured, and Abraham getting together his men and arising to fight these people to get Lot and his possessions back. And then, again, we are interrupted in the story as Abraham is returning from this venture. He's coming back, and as he's crossing through the Valley of Sheva, two kings appear. And we're going to really hone in on the first king and talk about this guy, what he's all about. Um, so starting in verse 17. Then after his return, talking about Abraham, um, from the defeat of uh, Shadolamar, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. So who is this Melchizedek guy? That's all we have about him in the Old Testament. And how is he casting a shadow of Christ in such a small yet profound passage?
passage. If we jump over a little bit ahead to Hebrews 7, we find a little bit more about this guy and who he was. In verse 1, we say, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of most high God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was of all was first of all by the translation of his name king of righteousness and then also king of salem which is king of peace so what is that telling us and how is that pointing to christ as shadow we know that the righteousness of melchizedek was beautiful we see that in how he blessed abraham he was he was just he was he was not just a righteous king right he was not cruel, he was nor a tyrant, but one who feared the most high God and was justly dealing with people. We see that in his interaction with Abraham. And that is being established, showing how he was a righteous king. Um, Also, we see that you have to be able to see that the righteousness of Melchizedek was not ultimately and not was not ultimately able to be established forever. It was not a righteousness that we could become participants in. But he was a righteous king pointing forward to Christ. And then the peace, the king of peace, what does that show? Um, I think it was Calvin who actually said, righteousness and peace are intertwined. Without righteousness, Peace cannot be established. And it is only through a perfected righteousness that we can become participants in that peace can be established with God. And Melchizedek, though a beautiful picture of Christ, as Hebrews 7 will so point to, he could not within himself make us participants in his righteousness that peace could be fully established with God. And then it moves on. We see that through the blessing Melchizedek pronounced on Abraham, through the promises that he saw the promises of God, and he cherished those promises. He knew them. And he pronounces this blessing, again, showing that he understood the most high God. He knew who he was, and he wanted to bless Abraham because of that understanding, and because he saw that in him. But that he knew that Abram, at this point, as he goes through the blessing, if we walk through this, he says, He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He knew that Abram wasn't capable of anything apart from the God Most High. He saw that. He understood the blessings and he understood the promises to be from God and that God accomplished them through Abram. Not that Abram in himself was able to accomplish those things, but that God through Abram was able to accomplish those things. So, We keep moving on, and in verse 19, if we look at that again, we see that the blessing of Melchizedek on Abram, the one whom the promises of God had been established with, shows how he was a righteous king who sought to praise God most high, sought to worship him and bless the ones whom God has blessed. In Hebrews 7, verse 6, it says, But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abram and blessed the one who had the promises. He knew that Abram had the promises, and he blessed him. He blessed him because of that. So what are these promises? Or what is this promise that we're talking about? In Genesis 12, 3, uh, two through three, 
there is this promise made from God. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That is the promise. Those are the promises that it's talking about. Established with Abram. And then if we look at Hebrews 6, 13 through 14, it reiterates this in a different way, saying, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. God could not swear by anyone greater. Melchizedek heard the word of the Lord and listened. He listened. He attuned his ear to the word of the Lord and blessed Abram because he understood. So it can, it can be established. We can, we can see how this Melchizedek was a righteous king. He ruled righteously. He wasn't a tyrant. He wasn't, he wasn't cruel. But he sought to deal with a righteousness with the people. And then peace. He did not seek to lord his authority over anyone. He did not seek to push himself on over anyone. But he established peace. He sought peace. He was a king of peace as Hebrews 7 is going to say. So, at this point, we see how his kingship pointed to Christ. And we'll look at that a little bit later, how ultimately Christ is the fulfillment of the peace and the fulfillment of the righteousness. Hebrews 7, 3 says, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a, per, a priest perpetually. Melchizedek can then be established as a royal priest of God Most High. Genesis uh, 14, verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. It establishes that. And what Hebrews 7 3 is saying without father without mother without genealogy it's saying that the silence of the scriptures on this port part in genesis we know that gene genealogies are so prevalent they run rampant throughout genesis but why then is there no established genealogy of melchizedek and why is there no time frame of his death there's no recording of death nor of birth, nor of father, nor of mother. And it was Pink who said, the silence is perfect, and it makes for golden. And what does that mean? What was he saying when he said that? What he means is that the shadow that Melchizedek was casting was showing that the Son of God, Most High, would be the only eternal priest, perpetual priest, with no beginning of days nor end of life. He defeated death. And the author is using that to point from Melchizedek to Christ in that way. In verse 20, it says, And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And we know that, in, um, and it also goes on to say, he gave him a tenth of all, a tenth of all. Who could receive, when we get to the law, who could receive and was to receive the tithe, the tenth? In Numbers 18.23, it says, To the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance, in return for their service which they performed. It was the priests, the sons of Levi, who could receive the tithe. So again, this is showing how Melchizedek was functioning as royal priest, a kingly priest. But as you walk through Hebrews 7, it shows that he did not, he would not have 
come from this line of um, Levi. He wouldn't be a Levite. He would have been from the tribe of Judah. So it shows this. What it shows is that he was not nationally bound. Melchizedek was not nationally bound to a nation as priest, where the Levites were bound nationally to Israel. He would not be bound nationally to anybody, but to God alone. And then it would go forward, and it talks about Christ. He's not bound nationally. He is the Son of God. He is God. He is the priest over all, eternal, forever. For those who believe, he is our advocate as priest. So, moving on. It shows with, with the no traceable genealogy that this is compared to Christ's eternality. So it's walking through how the kingship of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Melchizedek was a shadow, a foreshadowing of what Christ would be, of who Christ is, was, and will always be. So let's talk about Christ as king and priest. In Psalms 110, verse 4, we see, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In 1 Peter 1, 2, we see, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Christ alone is the eternal priest whose sacrifice is the atoning power that lasts forever. His priesthood is an eternal one where he acts on our behalf before the Father, being ultimately assured of being pleasing to the Father when we come to Christ because of his sacrifice. There's only one truly atoning sacrifice, and that is the cross. That is Christ. Only a perfect, eternal priest could establish peace with God through making us participants in his righteousness in the cross, in his resurrection. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. He established peace to God by our being justified through him. He established peace with God by our being justified through him. We become participants in his righteousness so that peace is established with God. It is only through him, our eternal priest, that we are able to have peace with God being established as righteous. Only in Christ's righteousness are we made participants so that we are made righteous before God through him. That was not possible through Melchizedek. Though Melchizedek was a perfect shadow of what was to come, a beautiful one. And then we look at Christ as king. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, we see this. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We understand that Jesus Christ is king over all. He is established king over all. We see in Colossians 1 verse 16, for all things were created by him, both the earth and the heaven, both visible and invisible. For him they were created, and by him they were created. His dominion is over all. 
as Melchizedek would say, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. He is the possessor of everything. His kingship is established. And this is pointing as a shadow of Christ's kingship over all, established through the cross and through his resurrection. He is king over all, eternal priest forever. And Hebrews 4.14 establishes this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. He has passed through the heavens. He is our great high priest. He is both king and priest, perfected, eternal, over all. So what then? How does this ultimately affect us? How does this passage ultimately help us? essentially. What is the practical application, if you would? We see after the encounter of Melchizedek, we see this encounter. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear you would say I have made Abram rich I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the shares of the men who went with me Anner, Eskol and Mamre let them take their share so what is Abram saying here and how does it fit in this picture Because some might say that this insertion of Melchizedek is out of place. It doesn't make any sense. But it's a comparing and contrasting the two kings and Abram's response. What's so different? When Melchizedek shows up, why does Abram eat the bread and receive the wine with him and have this celebration? It was the perspective. The perspective. Melchizedek was giving the glory to God. He said, Abram, this is not because of anything you are or anything you've done. It's everything who God is as possessor of all, as king, deliverer. He's the deliverer. He is the one who went before you and fought for you. And then the king of Sodom comes and says, here, take this. Trade your people. Take this stuff. It's the allure of the world. It's look at the things, grasp the things, take them. They're they're all yours for the taking. And then the world lords itself over you like, I have given this to you. You owe me. And Abram says, I don't want that. For For fear that you might say, I have made Abram rich. It wasn't the world that Abram desired to have. It wasn't the world that he wanted to make him rich. He swore to the Lord that anything he would receive would be from the Lord alone. That was it. But what is this to say? Is this all to say that everything that we have is wrong? We shouldn't have anything? Not at all. I think that is, we should work hard and make money to support ourselves. But it is the perception of why we do this is why we live, why we breathe, why we work, why we do everything for the glory of the Father, for the glory of the king, the priest? Or is it for the glory of self as the allures of the world lead us in and take hold of us and take snare of us? Melchizedek had the right perspective. And Abram clasped to that perspective as he repeats it to the king of Sodom. As as Melchizedek says, Blessed 
be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Abram says, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. His faith in God, the possessor of heaven and earth, the king, the priest, trumped anything that that king could ever offer him in trade for that. That's the contrast. The contrast was Melchizedek came to him worshiping and saying, this is amazing. Blessed be the God most high. And this king of Sodom comes saying, I have worldly things to give you. I have possessions that you need. Treat me, your people. It was the essence behind which both kings did and acted. One out of heavenly thought of God, king forever, deliverer forever, priest eternal. And it was the thought of Sodom and that essence that he rejected. It is about the things you can gain. It is about the things you can taste. Trade this and I will give you this. And he said, No, because my faith in God, the vows I have made to my God, trump that. So, if we dare to forget Christ as king or priest, one might fall sway to the allure of the king of Sodom. Because we walk out those doors, and we have the allure of the world every single day throwing its possessions at us throwing these ideals at us, throwing these different, better places to be, happier places to live in, that money might fix things, that money is better than faith, things are better than faith. But Abram, in his vow and in his life, shows that faith triumphs over the world, because God is the possessor of it, the eternal priest of it, the king of it, for those who believe, eternally making peace with God and making us participants in his righteousness. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and I thank you. I thank you for the dominion and kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, who not one thing goes unnoticed by him or passes through his dominion because he is the creator of all things and the king over all things. I thank you for his priesthood, that In him, we become participants in his righteousness, our Lord, our God, that peace is established with our God, the Father. Through the Spirit and the working of the Spirit in those who believe, I thank you for all that you are. I thank you for the things yet to come, the hope that we have in your eschaton, and the hope that we have in your future establishing of your kingdom, that we have a perpetual priest on high, our Lord, Jesus. I thank you for him. I thank you for this time. And I pray in your precious and holy name. Thank mm-hmm. you.